Talk, tell me about your involvement in the uh, program this weekend. Well, I get to play with one of my favorite, two of my favorite people in the world, actually. One is Les, Les Paul, who I've known Les for a long time. And I get to play with the Ventures, which was the other group of folks that, if it wasn't for them, I probably wouldn't be playing the guitar. You know, I joined the Ventures fan club when I was 11 years old. It's great. Um, why do you think it's so important to recognize the in innovators of rock and roll like Les Paul? Well, I mean, how can you talk about nuclear fission without talking about Albert Einstein and uh, Oppenheimer? I mean, how can you talk about uh, the Mustang without John DeLorean? I mean, you know, you have to, what, what do you, how can you talk about any of the innovators without naming them? And Les was huge. I mean, he, he did a couple of things that were really important. He helped bring the guitar player out from behind the orchestra as a rhythm player into the arena of melodies and, and lead, which is a huge step. And then he did it with, uh, you know, with, with voracious intent and created an instrument that st has certainly withstood the test of time. The Les Paul is still the great standard. You know. It's like a, you know, a GTO. <laughs> it's just a standard, you know. <laughs> Eight big cylinders. Uh, it's, it's an, he's an, and he's an incredible guy. I mean, when you really look at what he did, not only did he create the instrument, but he created the medium that allowed the instrument to re be recorded in probably its its most uh, um, ubiquitous way, which was multi-track recording. Um, talk about tonight, the big show, the concert. You know, what do you think it'll be like to be on stage with so many you know, innovative and uh, you know, excellent guitar players such as yourself and everybody that's going to be there? Well, these are the kind of nights that you live for. This makes all doing all those crappy recording sessions and taking a lot of you know, garbage from people you hate, it makes it all worthwhile. They, they pay us to do that. They don't have to pay us to do this. Uh, I'm blessed, I know every single one of the folks in the show. I've played with them a number of times. And it is either a tremendous evening or just an excuse for a bunch of bozos to get together and have a really great time. It's both, it's both. We, I think everybody you'll see up there has been in some way or another involved with each other. I mean, certainly James Burton, I've known James for a long time. He, he puts together a wonderful festival for kids in, in Louisiana. Uh, Richie Sambora, Les, The Ventures. I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. You know? Okay, now we're going to talk about the Rock Hall itself. Sure. Um, you know, it's dedicated to, you know, celebrating rock and roll as an art form. Do you agree you know, that rock is an art form? And can you explain more about the importance of recognizing rock and roll as an art form and its you know, contribution to society and history and the world in general? Well, I mean, certainly rock and roll is an art form. I mean, art, it's, the definition of art is, is the, the translation of the pathos and the ethos inside a human being to, a, to the desire to communicate with someone else. So there's been a lot of that going on. Uh, as far as its meaning in the world, myself and the Hungarian ambassador came here to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame a few years ago to talk about soft power. He grew up behind the Iron Curtain, and rock and roll at that time was illegal. So to him, rock and roll was not only an art form, but it was a means to speak your freedom and speak your mind. So um, when they say, you know, what, what brought down the Soviet Union, uh, it certainly was, uh, you know, we outspent them. But French fries, Elvis Presley, and uh, blue jeans were definitely huge because soft power, the culture of that art form, is, is irresistible. And to this day, wherever you go in the world, I remember when I was a kid, I grew up in Mexico, and I had a horse uh, that, that we kept outside of Mexico City, and the, and the family that kept it, they didn't even have, they, they had no idea what was going on, but they knew what the twist was, the dance. So you gotta figure how powerful is this medium and how powerful is this art form? And you got less at the bottom of the pyramid, man. Just making it all happen. Now you've been to the Rock Hall. You toured, you just mentioned that. You know, what did you think of it? I think it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, monument to rock and roll. Terry Stewart and the rest of the crew has done an incredible job of making it special and making it accessible. That's it, it, it invites you, and it wants to talk to you. 
you know, it wants to bring you in and, 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 and hug you, as opposed to sort of being very standoffish like some museums and some halls of fame are. I think they did an incredible job. What stood out the most about it? Was it the accessibility and the right up there? Well, what stood out the most to me is the, is the friendliness of it, because rock and roll is a style of music that really couldn't exist without the involvement of the participants, both the musicians and the listeners. The dancing part of rock and roll and the, the interaction between the musicians and the audience is crucial, prescient to the music itself. And I think the Rock Hall really reflects that as a, it, it, when you walk in you feel, you feel kind of like it's, you're, you're already there, you know, you've, it's invited you. It's, it's very special. What, uh, you know, when you talk to people, if you've talked to them about the Rock Hall, what, what do you tell them about it and why they should visit it? Well, some of the things we mentioned before, one, I happen to love rock and roll a lot. Uh, I've played it all my life along with many other different styles of music, but um, I have a certain love for rock and roll. Uh, and when I tell people to visit the Rock Hall, especially other generations, my son is here, and it, he he's going to the Rock Hall tomorrow and for him it's going to be kind of like a learning experience. I mean I grew up inside it but in the same way as uh, when I go to a museum, uh, the Museum of Modern Art or the, or the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry, it allows me an in introspection and insight into a, a time that I wasn't familiar with as a, you know, in terms of my, of my life, lifetime but it, it gives me an education and brings me in to teach me and to um, help me understand you know, what that era was like. And so my son, when he goes over there, he'll see a little bit of what his dad was involved in. And also, he's a lover of music, and it'll allow him to pick and choose the things that he wants to know about, because there's so much there. You know? And it's not biased. It isn't one person over another. It's not one exhibit over another. It's all about rock and roll, the, the, the entire entity. That's uh, Margaret, anything we missed? No, that's great. Okay, we got these guys have questions for you. We're good. Too. Okay. Paris, is there anything else you want to add? Okay. okay. That's it. Sweet. Well, what was your first, you had adventures? Did you get the album and everything from the adventures to learn how to play? And the way it, for the, for the quick stories, I wanted, I was uh, nine years old and I wanted a bicycle. My parents gave me a guitar and I was really pissed off. And so I hung it on the wall and I had this friend of mine named Kurt Bundy who was living in an apartment downstairs. He said, listen, I'm taking some guitar lessons. If I, uh, if I show you some chords, will you, you know, play along with me? I said, sure, whatever. And as soon as I took it down and I learned a couple of chords, I realized I had just died and gone to heaven. And two things happened. One is I bought a Ventures album, the Walk Don't Run album. And then the other guy that changed my life was Howard Roberts. My dad had a DJ friend in the United States who sent me the first two Howard Roberts albums, and that changed my life. So between The Ventures and Howard Roberts, that was it. And did you ever imagine, you, you do a lot of things other than rock and roll, but did you ever imagine this would be a lifelong game? At that time, no. I mean, you dream, but you think, really, all it was is shedding, all I wanted to do was play the guitar. You know, not do any schoolwork, not do anything, just sit there in my bedroom for eight hours a day practicing, listening to records and trying to learn how to play the guitar. It was only later on that I, I guess I thought I could make a career at it. I think if you, if you start out trying to make a career of it, it leads you down the wrong path. I think it's, it's, it's about the Zen and the philosophy of it. And then if you get to the point where the guitar says to you, okay, you're allowed now to, you know, move to the next level, then I guess you think about career. Do you play a Les Paul? I play all kinds of guitars. Uh, I do a lot of studio work and you never know what they're going to ask you for. So I carry a number of different instruments with me, but I do have a beautiful Les Paul and I have a beautiful Super 400 that the guys at Gibson gave me years and years ago. And tonight I'll be playing an ES-175, that's a big jazz box. But I have a, a number of different guitars. I love Fender guitars. I love, I love the cheesy ones. Because when you're a kid and you only have 69 bucks to go in and buy a Silvertone at Sears, hey, you got a guitar, it's all, you know, who cares? It's made, it's made out of Masonite. It's fine. <laughs> it's loud. It works. <laughs>